Today's book review is The Serpent King by Jeff Zenser. About a month ago, I was chatting with a media specialist uh, on my Twitter feed. Um, we were chatting about, you know, different young adult authors, their books. She had said that she had just finished The Serpent King and couldn't put it down. That was enough recommendation for me. When she said that, that was enough recommendation for me. I trust her opinions. Uh, it took me a couple weeks. I finally got it, and I am... I'm just, uh, I am grateful that I got that recommendation and I read this book. This story is about three best friends uh, in rural Tennessee whose lives are intertwined in their outcastness. The story follows them through their senior year of high school in Forestville High School. The story picks up just before the year begins, at the end of the summer, just before the school year begins, and follows them through the year. Lydia, her father is the town dentist, uh, and that makes him one of the, you know, one of the better off families in the town. Her father picked rural Tennessee to move his family to, to give them a very safe and quiet, wholesome um, place to raise his family. He said he could have gone anywhere, but he picked here because he wanted that lifestyle and he wanted to be able to, to raise his family in that environment. Lydia is a blogger. She blogs about teen fashion mainly, uh, and her blog has really taken off. Her blog, Dollywood, W-O-U-L-D, a takeoff of the popular Tennessee attraction Dollywood, W-O-O-D, has thousands of followers. Um, Different fashion companies send her clothes and, and clothes and accessories to wear and to blog about, take her picture in, right? Uh, she's got, like I said, a huge following on all of her platforms, her blog, her Twitter, her Instagram. This has given her access to a lot of famous people. Not only the fashion uh, companies that follow her, uh, she was able to do an interview with a with a pop star. Uh, she's connected with the daughter of the editor of a very popular national teen fashion magazine. Uh, and the girl, in fact, actually the two girls were going to room together the following year at NYU. Lydia dreams of escaping the rural Tennessee lifestyle to live a very cosmopolitan life, uh, reporting about fashion, writing about fashion, following fashion, and living that cosmopolitan lifestyle. And this blog has given her the springboard to do that. But because the people around her, her, her classmates, her peers around her, see her as not wanting to stay, and that she's famous, she's social media famous, um, and Lydia, you know, doesn't necessarily hide her, you know, her disdain, her dislike of the rural lifestyle. Uh, people generally think, her classmates and peers generally think that she is looking down her nose at them or just constantly, um, you know, just constantly uh, putting them down. That makes her an outcast. Travis, on the other hand, he is not really looking to leave town. He's, he's content with where he's at, even though his lifestyle is less than optimal. His alcoholic father is abusive, both mentally and physically. His mother seems either unwilling or unable to protect him from the abuse. And his older brother enlisted in the service and was killed in action. Travis escapes his, his sad life by reading fantasy fiction. In particular, he loves the Bloodfall series, uh, a series, a fictional series that was compared to Game of Thrones. He loves that lifestyle. He loves that lifestyle. He'd rather be reading than, you know, doing things with other people, which in a way makes him an outcast. He also wears fantasy clothing, uh, things that represent that fantasy type life. He has a dragon pendant. Um, he carries a staff, dresses in all black. That makes him an outcast. And then there's Dill. Dill is the son of the fundamental Pentecostal preacher. 
Dill's father, like his father before him, the first serpent king, handled snakes, drank poison, spoke in tongues, and encouraged his, his parishioners to do the same to show their faith and their purity. Dill's grandfather committed suicide after having a mental breakdown. Dill's father was arrested, convicted, and jailed for child pornography that was found on his computer. That in and of itself is enough to make Dill an outcast. Most of his peers refer to him as the pervert preacher's son. But he's in the middle of this kind of like really perfect storm because outside of his social peer group, the congregants have turned on him. Many of the congregants believed, because Dill was, uh, was compelled to testify against his father, many of the congregants believed that Dill should have lied, that Dill should have said, no, that was my pornography, those were my pictures, I was looking those things up, not my father. They believed that he, they should, that he should have lied to save his father. Um, they, they wanted, and it's very selfish reasons, because they wanted him to be there to preach to them, to, to allow them to practice their faith. One guy even blames Dill for this, in this manner, and says that he drives a hundred miles each way every Sunday so that he and his family can practice their faith. Yet there were other congregants who believed that the images were actually Dill's, and that when he was on, on the stand, he did lie about it saying that it wasn't his, and that his father took the fall for him, that his father was protecting his son. And they really just can't believe how Dill would let his father take the fall for him. Dill is forced to go visit his father in the penitentiary. He believes his father is getting worse and worse and more radical every time he sees him. Plus, he's also very disturbed by the crime anyway. And his weak poor relationship with his father just continues to deteriorate. Dill is forced to work and to support the family, partially because his father's income is now gone, and partially because the huge legal fees that were racked up. So Dill is forced to work, basically full-time. Dill wants to go to college, but both of his parents believe that the only thing college will teach him is how to give up his faith, which he already is questioning to begin with. But because Dill feels that he is responsible, uh, that it is necessary for his, you know, that he helps his parents uh, by supporting them, and because they are so anti-college, he feels trapped. He feels like he cannot leave. On top of that, Dill is a great musician, but he's, he can't bear to perform in front of anybody. Um, he can't let that out. And he's in love with Lydia. And he can't say anything about that either. Uh, in fact, actually, he knows she's leaving. He knows she's going to college the next year. He can't prof uh, profess his, his love for her, uh, but he awkwardly tries to convince her to stay, even though he can't say that he wants her to stay because he loves her. Um, this this book, like I said, when I picked it up, it took me a couple weeks, and I picked it up, and and I'm just I'm just absolutely grateful that I did so. Uh, normally, when I talk about these books. I talk about how, you know, the message and the meaning behind it and, and, and why, you know, my students should be reading it or people should be reading it. But this book, and it has all that. This book has all that. But the power of this book really is the way the story is told. When I first started reading it, the first week or so, the first week, week and a half, I was reading it. Uh, I was into it. I thought it was a good story. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Um, I was into it. And then all of a sudden, an event happens. And I don't want to give it away, but it got me. And looking back, it was like this snake. This snake that just slowly coiled its way around me. And then all of a sudden, it latched on. It had me. I couldn't escape. I literally read the last hundred pages in one setting. I could not put that book down. What's even more, not only did this event get me, and, and it just started this roller coaster, it was an emotional roller coaster. There's a point, just a few pages after this, that I literally could not turn the page. 
I was not prepared emotionally for what I was about to read, what I thought I was about to read. I, was, I couldn't emotionally turn the page. And I think that's the power of this book. I think it's the power of the book. It, it's a great story. And there's great message and there's great meaning. And I think that my students can really pick up some great things from this. And after they read it, I'd love to talk to them about it. But I think the great power of this book is just the masterful way that the story was told. The artful writing, the emotional connections that slowly work you in until you cannot escape. I generally reserve my fifth, my top bookshelf for books that not only have great messages, but are well told. This book is it. It is one of those rare books that comes along that I say my students must read, that I actively encourage my students, you've got to read this. It is this good. You need to get this book. Reserve yourself some time to read it because I believe you too will have that same emotional reaction and will be slowly drawn in and trapped to where you have to finish it all at once.